<clears throat> we're going to talk about, we're, I'm, I'm kind of doing this piece about some of the essentials of the faith. And, uh, you know, we talked about the Bible, we talked about prayer, we talked about the need to go to church. And, and I, I, I want to talk about worship. And I, I feel like we've talked about worship before, but I, I want to just kind of percolate there a little bit and, and just consider what happens in worship. Because believe it or not, worship is one of the most important things uh, we do. Somebody was telling me the other day, boy, I don't like singing. And I said, well, you're not going to like heaven. <laughs> and they said, what do you mean? I go, well, we're going to worship God in heaven. So you might want to start practicing now. And, and, and really what it is, you might want to rearrange the way you think about God. Because worship is, is key to what it means to be a Christian and to follow Jesus and to, um, you know, have a relationship with God. And, and, and so, you know, I, I've been, somebody was telling me the other day, if you watched my morning thing, they were saying, hey, church is boring. And I go, well, you know, you're boring. <laughs> I didn't say that, you know. I didn't say that, but, you know, it's, that's what I was, that's what I deduced you know, as I walked away from the conversation, you know, that because really God is not boring and church is not boring. And, and one of the things that we do is, is, is go to church and have an encounter with God. I think I told you before about the little guy that, you know, said, Mom, what's the highest you've ever counted to? And she said, I have no idea. He said, what about why? What's the highest you've ever counted to? She, he said, 5,373. 5, she says, well, why did you stop there? He said, because church was over. Okay, so here's here's somebody who got nothing out of church. You know, he 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 did not and go with the ability to encounter God to experience anything. He just wanted to. He made church boring. How's that? Okay, um, and I don't think the worship of God should be boring because worship is a response to God. So you're coming to worship, and now you're responding to. God and whatever God you've had an experience with, whatever God you've encountered, whatever God you have um, <clears throat> been on a journey through life with, that's the God that you are worshiping. I mean, and the very essence of worship is, is engaging the presence of God, okay? What he's done for us, the answered prayers, the hope, the movements. And, you know, and I don't want to see a show of hands, but I hope that you've had some experiences with God. It's possible for you to go your entire Christian life without any experiences with God and go to heaven and everything's cool. You follow the rules. You know that Jesus saved your soul. But I really believe there's more to it. I really believe there's a Holy Spirit available to you. I really believe that God answers, shows up. Um, and it's not just to bless somebody else. Most, I would say half of the supernatural encounters that I've ever had include God just doing something with me, okay? And, and so the whole idea of worship is, it's, it's a little bit weird. C.S. Lewis, when he was investigating religions and trying to decide which one he was going to follow, he thought it was a little bit odd that God demanded to be worshipped, kind of like a, a vain woman who wants compliments. And, and, you know, people, you know, what kind of a God has such a small you know, insecurity problem, but, you know, he, he, he requires that we worship him. Well, actually, that's not the truth. Worship is when we, we show adoration for things, you know, the, you know, sports fans for their teams and readers, their books and, you know, people, their lovers and, you know, walkers, the countryside, okay? Um, we praise what we delight and value in. And, and here's where worship becomes really wild. When God reveals himself to us, how does he do it? This is how much I love you. This is what I've done for you. This is what I'd like to continue to do in you. This is the agenda that I have eternally with you and me and, and how I'd like to, to come alongside of you now. You start to realize that the God who reveals himself to you, it's about you as far as he's concerned. And then we turn around and go, whoa, it's about God. So... um. Yeah, it's about God. So, <clears throat> here's where we're at. Um, God's pointing us to the love that he has for you and me. And when we come to worship, we're responding to him. We're responding to what he's done for us. And um, 
you know, the fact of the matter is we always think, well, I'm going to go to worship. And, you know, you're going to church, and it's easy to go to church and sing songs, listen to a sermon, interact with people, recite liturgy, um, and, and not really worship God. You know, you maybe you sang some songs you like or didn't sing because you didn't like the songs. Preacher went six minutes over the hour, and you stopped listening, you know, at the, immediately at, at the end of six minutes. And, and, you know, there's all kinds of weird stuff that takes place in our heads, and, and um, you know, really, worship really isn't about the sermon. It's really not about the song choice. Um, it's about you coming into the presence of God, you bringing your agenda. And, and what is that agenda? Well, I got stuff that I need him to answer prayers. I got stuff that I want to say thank you to him for. You know, I, I came into the sanctuary this morning at five something because I, I, we, I had reasons to thank God. A, a nine-month prayer was answered. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you know, I, I got to get up early and go have a conversation. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, we, we far surpassed the budget this past year. This, I want to add this to the list of, wow, how great thou art. And so then the next thing, you know, another thing came to mind, and another thing came to mind. And, what I, I, you know, I, I came in here, and it just became a thank you fest. And I got this problem in my life, and even in the problem, to realize that God already knew that I was going to have this problem. He already knew that this would be my situation. And so guess what? He's involved. And what, what peace it put into my heart to this is the God that I came seeking this morning. And, and, and really, it's not about did church turn me on. It's about did I touch God's heart? Did I bring the right attitude? Did I bring the right heart? Did I come looking for him, or did I just come wandering into church because that's what I do on Sunday mornings? It's been a lifelong routine, okay? Just the shift that I'm coming to church to encounter God changes the whole dynamics of your day. It really, really does. And, and so, you know, worship does, it's, it's about giving him glory, it's about singing a song, it's about, you know, listening to a message, it's about bringing an offering, enter his courts, you know, that's coming to church, witnessing for him, you know, living lives that bring him, him glory. Um, it, it's all of this, it, we, we think that it happens on Sunday mornings, but it's not a once a week Sunday morning thing. It's a daily throughout the day way of living with God, okay? That's what worship is. As you go through your every day, you are in a state of worship. You know, we're talking about songs. I remember one of my buddies came up to me and says, man, can you tell the worship leader we got four songs to cut it back to three? I said, I'm the one who said, let's sing four songs. What are you thinking about? We're Presbyterians. Three was too many, okay? You know, just... <laughs> He, he doesn't like the songs. He wants, you know, he's just interested in getting to the meat, the message, and, and you know, that's, that's good enough for him. And, well, like I said, you better get used to singing songs because, you know, that's going to be the, the language of your heart, your soul, when you get to heaven. And, and speaking of songs, you know, we're supposed to sing a new song. Um, that's what the psalmist tells us, sing a new song. And, it's kind of interesting because if you're an old-time Presbyterian and working out of the hymnal, you know, we got songs, some of them are 500 years old, okay? I think A Mighty Fortress Is Our God, Luther, you know, that's a, that's a bar song that they used to sing in Germany, okay? And he turned it into spiritual lyrics and, you know, so I guess if you want to sing that song, we can have a, 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 I guess, a pint together, okay? We can have a pint on Sunday morning when we sing that song because, you know, Luther... Uh, did it that way. But, you know, a new song is what we're supposed to sing, which, you know, even humpback whales have a new song every year, so maybe we should have a new song. And a new song means that God's doing something new in your life. His mercies are new every morning. So there should be something new going on in your life. Um, I, I hate it when it's the same old prayer request, the same old issue, the same old... And if you're not careful, the same old could be day after week, after month, after year, after decade. And, and, and that's 
That's the issue. That's a problem. It shouldn't be that way. You should be transforming. There should be new elements of your relationship with God. Um, there should be new discoveries of His grace, new applications of how to share the faith. Um, there's, God is just not something that you, get, you figure out and then, you know, okay, let's move on to something else. It's an it's a endlessly deep well. And the deeper you get, the more intimate you get, the more powerfully you, 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 you become when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that can be happening, okay? And, and I, <clears throat> I think I shared with you one, you know, one year I lived in London and I always got the, the, the news a week later. And somehow it was just completely irrelevant. We didn't have these phones back then, you know, I couldn't find out what was happening, you know. Um, you know, but I, like I found out a week later who won the Super Bowl kind of a thing, you know. And it wasn't my team. San Francisco beat John Elway. I remember. But, you know, when you get the news a week later, it, it somehow it, it doesn't work. And, and I guess, what about your own spiritual lives? I remember way back when, when God did this. And, and those are favorite memories. Those can propel you forward. But the problem is, if you only have way back when moments, I think you can stop and say, okay, what's going on now? How come nothing fresh is going on? Why am I stuck here? What's getting in the way of me experiencing more of God? That needs to be a question that we lift up, okay? Um, I remember Martin Luther said, Christ is as fresh to me now as if he just shed his blood on the cross an hour ago, okay? He lived in that constant, close awareness of what Jesus did for him and made available to him. So um, this, this just really, I don't know, it just makes it all come alive. And, and, you know, when you walk daily with God, he answers prayers. And, wow, I, I, I can, I'm thinking a couple of weeks ago, I had a big prayer answered, and, and I don't know that I properly thanked him. And, and I realized that one, it's three in the morning, and I wake up, oh, I never really gave God the amount of praise in comparison to the amount of desperation prayers over this, this answer. You know, oh, please, oh, please, my life depends on it. Then it happens and you go, thank you. You know, and, and wait a minute. You know, I, I think that would hurt his heart. You know, you, you remember when you give the kids a really big Christmas gift and they're like, oh, yeah, that's cool. And they like, no, I just spent a lot of money, put a lot of energy, a lot of time, and I don't want to give you the gift anymore. You know, I mean, you give it to them anyways, but, you know, it's, it's, there's just not that. And, and so when you realize God's so invested in you that maybe you should stop and emotionally Get invested in him. And I think that's what worship is supposed to be. An emotional response from the inside of you to who he is and what he's done for you. Okay? At the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about him. That's why old school, you know, <clears throat> you know, I happen to be in jeans right now, but, you know, there was a day you'd never be in jeans when you go to church, right? And, you know, it's kind of weird in Florida, people come to church with, you know, shorts and t-shirts and, you know, other people are in nice suits. And, and back in the day, it was nice suits only. You know, when I got here, I, I was all suited up with the tie and everything. And the associate pastor said, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't do that here. You know, it was like casual Friday every day. I thought, well, this is, I guess that's cool. But you know why people dressed up? Because... They wanted to honor God. They wanted to bring their best. They wanted him to know that, hey, you know what? You're worthy of a coat and tie. And, and, and you know, yeah, it's cool that you come in with your, you know, your T-shirt and shorts. I don't really care. I'm so glad you're here. But, whoa, it's a lot different than I'm going to put on my favorite shirt because I want God to have a little joy with me. And, you know, when Solomon built the temple, it's kind of fun. Fire came down from heaven. And, you know, I was thinking about it. Something special was established 
for God and God responded. And, and I think sometimes when you make that extra effort, that special acknowledgement, that, that personal response, some fire falls down. Now realize when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, you get baptized with spirit and fire. So the Holy Spirit is the activator of the fire. And that fire is, is, is yours to experience. Okay? And, you know, the content of the King, you know, Solomon's prayer was, you know, Lord, forgive our sins, hear our prayers. It wasn't for the, you know, the, the Quilters Guild or the softball team. It, the, the place was established for the spiritual business of meeting with God. And when you're about the spiritual business of meeting with God, guess what? You're worshiping. And, and again, I'm not asking for a show of hands. But a lot of times you can go through the routine of going to church. And if you're not careful, it, be, it becomes a season of your life. And if you're not careful, it, church gets relegated to something that you do, not a super special place. And it's supposed to be that. And I think every Sunday it's supposed to be that. You know, I, I, we just finished the Christmas season a month ago and I got this letter from somebody who said, you know, we came to Florida and we, and she named about six sites that they went to, this Kennedy Space Center and, you know, Disney and all these other places. And, but I didn't experience Christmas until we came to your service, okay? And, and you no, know, they're, in, they're in the holiday season and what she was saying is I was longing for Christmas, but it wasn't happening until I made the effort for Christmas Eve Sunday evening. And, and, and I guess that's what I want you to know. When you come to church, it can be Christmas Eve every day where you have an encounter with God who gave his life for you. You know, the Lord showed up. And I'm going to say the same power and the same opportunities available to us. Um, people gathered because, well, they know we live in dependence upon God. And one of the things that's always talked about is forgive our sins. And, 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 and this is something that gets kind of, you know, washed over. You know, we know that we're forgiven. We are forgiven because of the cross of Jesus Christ. But, but there's, there's something powerful about lifting up the fresh need for forgiveness. It keeps you connected to the cross of Jesus Christ. Because I have friends who go, they'll sin and they go, oh, it's covered by the cross. And I'm like, well, you know, it's just a little too casual there. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad. I love the confidence that you have that your sins are forgiven. Yes, that's, that's impressive. But I, I feel like, ooh, wait a minute. Um, Lord, I need to lay this before you. I had a stray thought the other day. And it wasn't a bad thought, but I just felt it was a little too casual. And I repented of that thought. I'm like, you know, Lord, I don't feel like, you know, I, I, it was a little bit of a snarky comment, you know, and, and uh, boom, I, I repented because I'm invested, I'm aware of when I'm casual, I'm aware when I got an attitude, I'm aware when I'm looking for the loophole, I'm aware when I've got a little snarky, I'm aware, and, I, and, and who am I talking to? The living God. Some of us get cynical and, you know, we, we, we'll say the wrong things. We'll get a little attitude about God because we don't like what's happening in our lives right now. One of my friends' dad lost his wife and he, and he goes, I'm the modern day Job. And I'm like, no, you lost your wife. Okay. Don't go comparing yourself with the holiest man there ever was. Okay. Yeah. Actually, Job didn't lose his wife either, by the way. You know, God left the wife so that she could nag him, right? I just wanted to point that out, okay? She didn't nag him, okay? She identified with his pain and said, curse God and die. You know, it's, it's more complicated than that. We'll do another sermon on it another time. But my point is, I think sometimes in worship, the depth of your emotional awareness has a lot to do with what you experience in, in worship, 
Okay? Very important that you hear us. And I, and I love the fact that in, in the Bible, you know, it says God was with Moses, God was with Noah, God was with David. But you and I have something so much deep. God is in us. And this is a big deal. Suddenly, um, immediate, immediate, it's like my thought and the Holy Spirit are right there. He's right there to intercept, or when I did the snark, <laughs> question. The, there was no attitude, there was just like a question mark came up. I'm like, oh, this is not an acceptable statement. Pulled it back, all right? Because the Holy Spirit's right there to convict, to uh, encourage, to redirect, to get us in the right spot with God, to make us aware of the forgiveness of God, to make us, bring us in tune with God. And friends, that's what worship is all about, being in tune with God. It's very personal. You know, this one kid, his dad said, what do you want for Christmas? And he goes, well, I don't really care. He goes, what do you mean you don't care? He goes, I guess I want a, a ball. What kind of a ball? I don't really care. He goes, well, I mean, do you want a football, a soccer ball? He goes, I'll tell you what, Dad. If, if you're just going to give me, if you're going to give me a gift and, and that's all there is to it, then give me a soccer ball so I can kick it around with my friends. But if, if you want to partner with me and play with me, I'd like to have a football that we can throw back and forth. You see, he was more interested in the gift giver than the gift. And when we come to church, a lot of times, you know, I don't know about you, but I do have an agenda. Oh, Lord, I need this. I need that. Help me here. Help me there. Help me everywhere. And, and you know, what we really want to do is say, okay, whew, how great thou art. Whew, how amazing that you're, you're, you, 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 and, you know, it's fun the way that David will talk about such grandiose components of who God is and then get into the nitty gritty of his prayers. It's like, Worship is figuring out who he is. And then when you're aware of who you're talking to, suddenly you bring your, your thanks, your praises, your requests to him. Um, and, and, you know, we talked about being uh, specific to God's nature. Uh, uh, this morning in my, my conversation, I, I talked about Solomon. He prayed to the, the general God of creation. Now, his father probably had among the most intimate relationship with God of anybody in the Bible, wrote the prayer book of the Bible, okay? I mean, we're talking David had the tightest relationship with God. His son doesn't even know him that way, all right? And um, here's the problem. How are you approaching him? Are you approaching him in a very personal way? Are you aware of what he's done for you, what he's made available to you, how much he likes you, how much he forgives you, uh, what vision he has for your life? Or are you just kind of like, well, whatever? Because the whatever, that's what you get back, whatever. But let me tell you what happens when you do worship. Remember when Paul and Silas get thrown in jail? Um, first, they get beaten, by the way, beaten with rods metal rods, okay? So their back is probably just, you know, the skin's ripped off kind of a thing. I don't know if bones are broken or what, but, you know, th these guys have taken a serious beating, then they're thrown in prison. And um, what would you do in that situation? Well, <laughs> I definitely have a conversation with God about this. Here I am preaching the gospel and sharing the message, and this is how I get treated, right? These guys praise they worship. And when they worship, the earthquake comes, the chains fall off, the gates get broken open, the guards all fall asleep. Um, you see, when you praise, it's actually a weapon of God's protection lifted over you. Let's take another biblical example. Um, in, in Second Chronicles 20, you know, army's coming against the king, and the king says, um, you know, we don't know what to do. It's, I think it's Jehoshaphat, right? We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And, and, it, and it's, it's such a beautiful statement. This, this huge million 
people, armies coming against him. And it says, they stood with their wives and their children in the presence of God. Everybody stood before the Lord. And we said, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And in that moment, a prophet steps up and says, you know, the battle's not yours, it's mine. In that, that attitude of worship, what says, you're our God. God says, okay, if I'm your God, I got this battle. And so what does the king do? He puts the praise man ahead of the army. Okay. He puts his, his worshipers to go before the army to meet the enemy because they're praising God because he answered their prayers and God did an amazing work of having the army kill itself, <laughs> you know, and uh, they get all the spoils. But what went before the great victory? An attitude of worship. We are presenting ourselves before you. We're bringing our frightened emotions to you. We're bringing our dependence to you. We're bringing the awareness of that you are the kind of God that does the amazing things from the past before you. And so, do you see in worship what's going on? It's a very, it's acknowledging who God is, what he does, how he operates. And that's why Paul and Silas, we don't care that we're beaten and in prison. We're going to praise God. And, and sometimes you can praise God because, you know what, I'm not dead yet. Or I praise God because I'm almost dead, which means I'm about to go to heaven. <laughs> okay? I had a friend in Ireland, and he's, 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 he's got cancer, and he's going to die soon. And, and um, he goes, every day I, I, I wake up and I'm scared, you know, am I going to die, am I going to die? And I said, listen, you've got to change it up. You wake up and go, oh, I haven't stepped into... The, the presence of God yet, so I'm going to enjoy another day of life. I tried to reframe it so that death wasn't something that he was afraid of. It's the passageway to eternal life, and I, I think he adopted this frame of mind because every time I talk to him now, he's positive, okay? And, and, and so I think sometimes you have to prepare yourself to be in the presence of God. You know, one time Dante, the guy who, who wrote... Um, you know, Dante's Inferno, Paradise Lost, all, all that, you know, that really amazing art. And it has the layers of hell. And that was the first book I ever read. You know why it was the first book I ever read? So my mom had all the great books of literature, and it was the smallest book. <laughs> so I started my education off of a 15th century poet. <laughs> And the, the subject of hell fascinated me so much that I just kept reading, even though, you know, and I started to figure out, you know, and, and it was, it was kind of cool. But um, it, it scared the hell out of me, though, you know, okay, you know, just the book about going to hell. So one day he's in worship, and, you know, there's liturgy, and you're supposed to stand and kneel and do all these things, and he's lost in his relationship with God, and so he doesn't stand at the right time, and people go reported him to the bishop, and the bishop was, what's this all about? And he's like, well, you know what? You know, my eyes were on God. And if, if the people that were worshiping with me were, had their eyes on God, they wouldn't have been focused on me, would they? Okay? And, and really, that's what worship's all about, your eyes being focused on God. And, you know, sometimes you have to prepare for worship. You know how you prepare for work? Sometimes you have to prepare for, for church, but preparing for church is not the same as preparing for worship. When I prepare for church, I want to get the right clothes on. I want to make sure that my hair is not sticking out, which it does often. Um, I, I want to make sure that I got my offering. I want to make sure that, you know, I, I, that's, that's church. Worship, though, I'm entering into the presence of the living God. Now, there's some adjustments that need to be Address. Now there's some, ooh, I want to, lead, I want to lay this for, for him. Ooh, I got to ask forgiveness for this. Ooh, I'm really hoping that God's going to do something else. There's a whole different mindset on the inside of you that has to get prepared when you step in to worship. Okay? And, you know, we talked about the flag. Remember we used to have the flag waver? <laughs> you know, half the people liked her and half the people hated her, you know, and... 
I, I just always found it so fascinating because, you know, this, this is a person that was bringing an art that, you know, I, I'd never been at a church that had a flag waver before. I have a flag waver. I was, you know, cool, man, I got a flag waver. And if you watched her, she was just, you know, she didn't watch us. She could care less about us. She was just, you know, doing her flags, and it was all beautiful, and, you know, oh, that's cool. And I would lost interest in her. I was focused on the cross. I was focused on the Lord. I was focused on the words of the song. Um, I just want to say, you know, I think we are invited to set the tone of how we experience church, how we experience worship, how we experience God. And it all happens on the inside of us. And, and Hebrews 13, 15 says, offer a sacrifice of praise. Okay? And sacrifice means there's a cost involved. Now, obviously, I'm talking about the offering plate. But sometimes the cost, it's deeper than your, your tithe. It's, it's sometimes the cost is deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And I'd rather give 10% than deny myself sometimes, right? That's a little bit of a joke there, but what I'm trying to say is, oh my goodness, um, there's that place where a sacrifice of praise, I'm going to praise God even though um, I, 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 I uh, well, suddenly that's where you have to work it out. What am I sacrificing? What am I stepping into? Okay? And um, sometimes we praise even when the circumstances don't, don't make sense. Sometimes we praise even when it's not going our way. Okay? We're responding to his awesome salvation. And so, friends, when worship or church is boring, I don't think it's because God is boring. Um. God's been exciting from day one, and he hasn't changed, okay? Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I do not change. Hebrews 13, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means he's still inviting us to receive and enjoy uh, the multifaceted ways that he engages in our lives. And, and then there's another aspect of worship, you know, the multifaceted ways. You know, I'm used to, you know, I read the Bible, he shows up, I sing a praise, I feel warm, you know, I have a prayer, I, I, I can sense the connection. But, you know, there's people will call the office and they're really hurting. And as I minister to them, I can see the change in their demeanor over the phone. I can sense it, I can feel it, I can hear it. And, and guess what? It's a multifaceted way that God has just had an interchange. You see this happen when, you know... It's in the fellowship. It's in the sharing of your faith. Uh, it's amazing to share your faith with somebody who's rigidly not interested in the conversation and then watch them melt. Because guess what? God moved. Okay? This is a worshipful moment because he's blasted through the wall and touched the emotions. And, you know, I think... Something that you have to understand, and I'm, I'm going to close up on this, is the Holy Spirit is a big deal for us because the Holy Spirit is that presence of God inside of each of us. I, I told you the story before. Of Moody has, you know, powerful ministry, and these two old ladies come up to him and say, hey, you know, we've been asking that God would give you the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he goes, no, thank you. I got everything I need. And... He felt like that was an arrogant statement, and so he says, all right, you can pray over me, you know. And they prayed over him. And not too much later, the Lord fell on him in such a heavy way that he stumbled into a friend's house, and God's Spirit was poured out upon him to where he thought he was going to die. And when he got done with that event, he rose up, and he was a different Christian. He wasn't a good Bible application guy now. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. He was in tune with the heart of God. He was being led by, by Jesus to different people and different ways of speaking and sharing. And, and, you know, that's when all the million people that he brought to Jesus all happened. When the Holy Spirit got a hold of him. And, and so, once again, here I am talking about the Holy Spirit. Okay. 
Because I think you need to invite him into your life. Because when you worship, as you lift up from your emotional self to God, guess who gets involved? The Holy Spirit inside of you. It's, if the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf, do you think he's not going to praise on our behalf? Oh, yeah. Definitely. And that's why Jesus said you had to be born of the Holy Spirit. And the people, you know, people, I think we have a hard time. Oh, the Holy Spirit. You know, we don't even, we can't see the Holy Spirit. Well, remember my little, you know, pastor's note on planet nine? Okay. 20,000 mi million miles away. And, and scientists have never, astronomers have never seen planet nine. Well, why do they think there's a planet nine? Because they can see the impact on all the other cosmic entities around it. And you might not see the Holy Spirit, but you can see the impact of the Spirit's ministry in and all around you. Okay? So if you want to call the Holy Spirit Planet Nine from now on, I'll know exactly what you're talking about. But I think that's a little weird. Just call him the Holy Spirit, okay? Okay? Well, I don't know. Um, David danced before the Lord. It, you know, when I was a young guy, I'm in Los Angeles, right? And so I grew up in a Presbyterian church. I went to a Baptist seminary, hung out with Holy Spirit folks. Um, you know, I got to see some dancing in the Spirit. Went to the African American church, and oh my goodness, this is just like a normal thing that they do. They dance. Okay, it's like a three hour experience. And they take two offerings. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> I didn't mind the three hours and I didn't mind the dancing, but the two offerings got to me, okay? But, you know, we got seminary professors who will not dance with their daughter because the Bible does not permit dancing. No, the, the Bible doesn't prohibit dancing. Your religious rules prohibit dancing okay because David leaped before the Lord and his wife disdained him and so God made it so that she couldn't have any children maybe you should not disdain people who dance or raise their hands or speak in tongues or choose to recite liturgy or do rosary beads or whatever form of worship they have maybe we should just embrace everybody okay and, and enjoy the creativity and the variety in the multifaceted angles of worship. Well, that's all I'm going to say today. I got more to say, but I think you're tired of me.